And in the past, she actually reversed her breast cancer stage four with a plant-based diet. She is also so accomplished. I think she's written six books. I think she's even won some medals in the Olympics. She has done so much. She is a doctor and we have a lot to talk about today. So you guys are going to want to watch this one right through to the end. It's going to be so good. Let's hop right into it. Hey, Dr. Ruth, how are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. Thank you, Jillian, for having me. It's a delight to be here. Yeah. And there's so many other things you've done. I think you were the first vegan to compete in the Ironman, right? I think that was in Hawaii. I'm not sure. There's just so many it, things. Yeah, and you're right. 1984, the first vegan to ever do the Ironman triathlon. And so you, yeah, and you're 89. So you know a yeah. lot. We can learn a lot from you. You reversed your cancer with a plant-based diet. I think this is just so amazing. So miraculous. So where I would love to start, I think that was when you were about 47 years old. I'm not sure, but where I would love to start is how you were eating prior to that diagnosis and like how you figured out you had the breast cancer in the first place and what happened. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say there, you're going to be the same a year or two from now, except for the people you meet and the books you read. And in my case, was I ever fortunate to know about Kenneth Cooper, who coined the word aerobics back in 1968. He was doing research on fitness and aerobic capacity, which had not been explored at that time. I happened to be at a newsstand getting ready to board a flight and looking for something interesting to read. And I saw this word aerobics on the newsstand. I thought, oh, I've never seen that word before. What does it mean? Picked it up, thumbed through it, and and it was all about exercise. Well, I kind of already knew exercise was important, and uh, I did some sit-ups and, and uh, squats, and, but that was it. When I read about running, I thought, oh, I'm going to try that. was immediately hooked. The second person and book this tattered, <laughs> can you see how old it is? Dr. John McDougall, back in 1982, was doing research on breast cancer. He had been studying. He was a, a new doctor. He had just finished a residency here in Hawaii, luckily, because he was originally from Michigan. He and his wife, Mary, had decided that they'd had enough of Michigan. They were going to go to Hawaii and they, they loved it. They stayed. He had been doing research in the Queens Hospital Library, and he was looking at animal studies and epidemiological studies about breast cancer. And it, it convinced him that there was a dietary component in breast cancer. And so he wanted to prove it, and he ran a small ad Oh, I have it someplace here. But anyway, it's a small three or four line ad wanted women for breast cancer research. This was so timely. I had just been diagnosed with this tumor and it had been an excisional biopsy, which means they don't know what it is. They they see the lump. I mean, when I... Uh, leaned over. You, the lump was so obvious. I don't know how it got so big overnight. But anyway, he they did an excisional biopsy where they tried to cut the whole thing out. And uh, when they got it out, it was more than five centimeters, not millimeters, wow. centimeters with no clear margins. That means it had almost taken over the whole I had no idea how this could have happened. So I was in a state of shock and had thought that I had always had a good diet. As a matter of fact, I, at this point, had had nutrition in university courses mm -hmm. and thought I knew <laughs> enough about nutrition. I had their book and it was like uh, chicken and fish are better than red meat and low-fat dairy, you know, you still see these guidelines. It's so frustrating, <laughs> my gosh, especially here in the U.S. Yeah, we're the, the worst in terms of money driving advertisement and promotion of 
the ways to make the most money by selling meat and dairy products, processed foods. So when I read that ad, I thought, well, okay, he's doing research. Uh, the doctors told me that diet had nothing to do with breast cancer. Okay, I'm going to help him, help Dr. McDougall prove that diet had nothing to do with it. So I called him and it's a local phone number. I knew, oh my gosh, a prefix of 262. Like that's close. So I immediately picked up the phone, got right through to him. Now, how often when you call a doctor, you end yeah. up talking to him? Oh my gosh, it's real. They have gatekeepers and then gatekeepers for the gatekeepers. So anyway, I'm talking to Dr. McDougall and told him I had just been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. He said, get your medical records, come on into the office, I need to talk to you. And I thought, okay, good, we're gonna prove that it, whatever causes, caused my breast cancer. Because at this point, I was also a runner. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to 1968, I did my first run, I came back, I, I felt so invigorated and so proud of myself because back in 68, nobody was running except if you were trying to catch a bus or running from the cops. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I did it early in the mornings yeah. before going to work so nobody would see me. And so I told Dr. McDougal, well, I know it's not my diet because I know, uh, you know, my dairy is so low fat uh, I was eating or drinking Carnation Instant Powder, you know, low fat. But what I did not know at the time was the casein in milk protein is a cancer promoter. T. Colin Campbell was doing research on, on cancer cells and found out that casein was like an on-off switch for cancer growth. Wow. And when you remove the casein, the cancer shriveled up. And had it been implanted on the bellies of animals, which they were doing at the time, the cancer would just fall off. And he told me about this. And uh, I thought, you know, that makes sense. But in the back of my mind, I thought, well, I'll just do both the, the diet and the uh, chemotherapy and radiation, which you know, I was given confidence that this would give me my best chance to beat the cancer by the oncologist. So, you know, as an aside, uh, looking at my oncologist now, I think about him sitting at his desk, leaning back, and he had this visceral fat in his belly. He was, I found out much later, 45 years old and died of a heart attack two years after I saw him. No way. And he was the one that assured me diet has nothing to do with breast cancer. And we didn't even know at the time it was the major factor of heart disease. So when Dr. McDougall was looking, coming through my records, he said, you know, with a cholesterol of 236, I think your standards in Canada are different, but 236 is, is high. He yeah. said with this high a cholesterol, you are at as high a risk of dying of a heart attack as you are the breast cancer. I said, now wait just a minute. I have been running 14 years. I've run marathons. I'm as healthy as and fit. And a heart attack? Oh, no way. Well, this was about two years before Jim Fix wrote his book, The Complete Book of Running. Might you remember that, that, that uh, when, yeah, when the running boom really started taking mm -hmm. off in the 70s. It's he, 10 uh, o'clock. He, oh, I'm sorry for that interruption on the time. That is the only way I can keep moving every 15 minutes when I hear that trigger, exercise, yeah. sitting. I know because you say sitting is the new smoking, right? I've heard yeah. you say that. And so what I do, if I can, I will stand up and do some squats and do some nitric oxide workouts. In this case, I will just squeeze my glute 
squats and my quads <laughs> and get a little exercise. So, and I encourage my audience to do the same thing. Exercise and uh, keep the blood moving in your arteries, even up to the brain. So anyway, uh, when Dr. Showed, McDougall showed me all the research, I thought, well, yeah, it, it does make sense. And I thought, well, how can dairy be good, uh, not be good for you? And what about, you know, I had the typical questions about mm -hmm. protein mm -hmm. and calcium and uh, energy. You know, I thought without protein, I was racing at the time. And although uh, I was not winning anything and uh, hmm. so I, well, you know, what's more important? So he uh, gave me a copy of, of this book. It's called Making the Change, a Diet Plan to Give You the Best Chance to Heal and Stay Healthy. Well, his wife, Mary, uh, came in and she started talking about uh, how to prepare foods without meat and oil. So uh, we talked about different recipes and, uh, and how to get enough calories and the benefits of uh, legumes and, and uh, lots of, of, of leafy greens and, and, you know, a really healthy diet. And so I walked out of the, oh, they spent two hours with me. You know, wow. as I yeah. did, he was a young doctor just getting started, he had just opened his office in Kailua, which is on the other side of the, the island here. And and uh, I think he was having trouble getting patients because uh, when they came in and he talked about giving up meat and dairy, you know, they'd walk away saying, no way. Uh -huh. and so, But did to, you, did you feel in your heart and your gut, like this is the right thing to do? You just felt something driving you to do this? I partly that, but then as I mentioned before, I thought I can do both, you know, so to, to make sure that the cancer doesn't kill me. And uh, when I mentioned that, why not do both? He said, because if you have chemo and radiation and the diet works, they're gonna say it was the chemo and radiation that saved your life. So you've got to pick just one. And I, so I thought long and hard for and then I kept thinking, what about those studies, the animal studies, the epidemiological studies? The highest rates of breast cancer are in the Scandinavian countries, uh, like uh, and also Australia, Canada, where they have the most uh, animal products, they have the most breast cancer. You know, we call it the standard American diet, but it's the standard Western diet. So I thought, well, uh, it makes so much sense. And two hours later, I walked out of there, confirmed that that this diet was going to save my life, that it made so much sense. And yeah, it might be hard giving up some of these things at first, but when I got home, I told my then husband what I'd found out. I said, wow, look, you know, this all this information. Uh, my breast cancer was caused by eating meat and dairy. And he, he was shocked. I was shocked about the cancer diagnosis. I was shocked at his reaction. He said, oh, my God, you've fallen into the hands of a quack. This is ridiculous. It, we know that you got to have enough protein from meat. And I said, no, 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 he showed me the research. He said, that's bullshit. He said, that is so ridiculous. And so I thought, well, went back to McDougall <laughs> and said, oh. and uh, he, he, he was so supportive. And he, he said, you want to see more research? And I said, no, I think uh, he showed me the files, all the research in there. And and by the way, I was working on my PhD at the time. I'd already gotten a master's degree and was working in psychology. And the more I realized the diet is so important that, that nutrition is, if you get the nutrition straight, you don't have the psychology problems that there's a link there. So 
I changed my research and studies and uh, ended up getting my PhD in lifestyle management, the role of diet and exercise in a healthy lifestyle. So when I got home and it found this resistance, I thought, well, I've got to do it alone. And uh, if he won't do it with me, I'll do it alone. Wow. If, And I realized that he needed it too because he was not healthy, although he said he was. And after a short period of time, I found out that, oh, one thing, we were talking about the, the diet for breast cancer. And uh, I said, uh, you know, Dr. McDougall says it would help you uh, with your high blood pressure and your high cholesterol. And his next appointment with his next doctor uh, told him what I had done and what I had said and uh, asked him if Dr. McDougall's diet could possibly help me get off blood pressure pills, which incidentally led to ED, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know that then, and uh, his high cholesterol. And his, his doctor said, oh, no, that's silly. Diet has nothing to do with it. So guess what? He comes home and says, I told you so, you know, so, and Dr. Dr. McDougall, <laughs> and he says, yes, the doctors are not taught anything in med school about nutrition. You have to learn it on your own, like he did. And so I had the surgery uh, because it had spread so far throughout that right breast. Uh, they did a, a mastectomy, partial radical, modified radical mastectomy. So after the surgery and my change in diet, I recovered pretty fast, and surprisingly. And... I never quit running. You know, as soon as right after the surgery, I'm back in my room in the hospital and said, how soon can I run again? He yeah. said, oh, as soon as you feel like it. I said, how soon is that likely to be? And he said, oh, a couple of weeks at least. And I I thinking to myself, in two weeks, I am going to lose so much of my conditioning. Uh, and I'm going to heal faster than what he thinks. So uh, the next night, um, they kept me in the hospital for three days. So that second day, uh, I was thinking, I'm going to try at least walking up and down the hall. I had this IV stand, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because I had this IV in me and I was walking yeah. back and forth. And, and I was in a lot of pain. And so got back in bed. They gave me pain medication. And I said, well, he's right. There's no way I can run. Well, the third day, I'm thinking, I wonder. So I got up and walked <laughs> up and down. And I thought, you know, I feel pretty good. And so I told the nurses, tomorrow morning, I want to try a, a short run. Mm -hmm. And they said, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the surgeon says, I've got this ACE bandage wrapped around me. Running's not going to hurt it. So that next morning, I uh, called the nurse and I said, I need some help. Uh, I have my running shoes. I, you know, I've actually brought running clothes, my running shorts and running singlet to the hospital. So they helped me get dressed. And so I went out and uh, <laughs> did, did a short run and thought, wow. And so I talked to the doctor later and he said, I can't, can't believe it. There was a similar incident. Of, well, let me stick with this first story uh, because I had been running the Honolulu Marathon several times and this was July when I had the mm -hmm. diagnosis and surgery. The next Honolulu Marathon was in December. And so I thought, I'm going to run the marathon. And uh, so kept on training and, and recovering so much faster. And so at the end of that marathon, I had taken 17 minutes 
off my best time. Wow. That's amazing. I, and I felt so energetic afterwards. Wow. We had, right next to the ocean, Kapiolani Park is the start and end finish. And I did a swim afterwards and I felt so good. There was no question in my mind that this diet was so important. And people think you need the meat, right? That's crazy. Wow, Ruth. Yeah. I know. I know. And so uh, I placed, I got a gold medal. In fact, <laughs> you see behind me, there are almost a thousand different trophies because every race I entered, uh, well, back then, um, my very first race uh, was a 5K. I, I was a logistics officer at the Hickam Air Force Base. There. Wow. Yeah. And uh, started running every morning before going to work. And I started telling the the military guys that worked for me uh, about running and how benefit it, the many benefits it had. And they said, oh, we do some great occasional running too. Well, a few weeks later, uh, one of them handed me a flyer. There was, now again, this is 1969. And there was a race on the base, a short race. And they said, you ought to enter it. And I said, oh, that, that should be interesting. And so again, this is before marathons and all that, my mm-hmm. early winning. And uh, I got to the start line and uh, that Sunday morning, I looked around, I'm the only female there. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what if I can't finish? What if I'm last? I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't know what I had with my mind. Uh, so I was going to about to slink away and the gun went, went off and it was run or get trampled. So I had to take off and run and run. <laughs> and because I hadn't raced before, uh, my heart was pounding so hard. And I, I thought, I, I'm not, oh my gosh, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. And I slowed down a little and tried to catch my breath. And, and then all the guys around me and I thought, I got to go. I got to keep running. And finally, finally, I see the finish line and I cross it and think, oh, thank goodness I finished. And I looked around and I wasn't even last. And so I thought, wow, this is amazing for the diet, I know. And so then I heard my name, Ruth Heidrich, and went up and got my first first place medal, gold medal. (laughs) I thought, Oh, 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 wow. My, yeah. So, and, and then in, by 1972, there were having races with age divisions. Well, as I mentioned, I was 33 when I started running. And, uh, and when I got to 35 and 40, by that time, they were having age divisions. So I didn't have to compete with younger people. It's women in my class. And so when I hit 35, I was still the first. When I hit 40, (laughs) still the first. And uh, that's the way it it continued on. And so I was looking for every race possible. And in the meantime, all the bone pain that I had been having, that was the worst symptom of the cancer before being diagnosed was waking up in the middle of this of the night and walking and thinking I can't sleep this bone pain is just mm. so bad and I had previously told the doctor about this and when they gave me some medication for it, it wasn't working so they gave me stronger so here I was on opioid 15 okay time to <laughs> exercise <laughs> a little bit <laughs> yeah. I love it yeah yeah so uh and I, the, the all these meds weren't helping at all. And I, I had pain in my chest. They gave me nitroglycerin because they thought it was heart disease. Well, it wasn't. It was the, the cancer signs. Wow. Within weeks, all these symptoms started going away. In fact, at times when I give talks, a frequent question is, 
how soon did the diet start working? And I smile and say, the next morning. And I say, I had been constipated all my life. <laughs> and so <laughs> doctors had told me three or four times a week is normal for some people. And that's, that's you. What I found out the next morning, what normal is. And I thought, oh my gosh, another fantastic advantage is <laughs> getting enough fiber uh, to have regular normal bowel movements. That is such an important factor. in. And you feel happier too, didn't you find? Like I used to have that problem before I went raw vegan. And I was eating the standard American diet, a lot of animal products, drinking alcohol, having coffee, all these things. And I was constipated, not going to the bathroom as much. And then when I transitioned my diet and I started going more, I noticed a huge difference in my happiness too. Did you notice that? Because you're- Oh, you're yeah. Fat. Yeah. Yeah. Positively. And, and having fun and uh, talking to other people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you know what Venn diagrams are? They're circles of, in this case, people. I had uh, my circle here of all the nutrition people because Dr. McDougall uh, had put me in touch with other patients of his that were changing their diet. So it's like five or six people. And uh, in fact, we started the Vegan Society of Hawaii after Dr. McDougall left Hawaii and we were without support. So we formed the Vegan Society. So uh, and there are even more people in this circle of nutrition, but none of them were exercising. You know? And I kept saying, you got to try running. Are you kidding? Run? I haven't <laughs> run since. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and the other Venn diagram, what all the runners that I got to know from racing. And I said, you've got to change your diet. You'll be a lot faster. And they'd say, are you kidding? So here are these two circles. No, but recently there are more and more of an overlap mm. of people in both camps, both Venn diagrams. So uh, that's a sign of progress. It's uh, we've got a long ways to go, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, for example, I live in a condominium and I have neighbors <laughs> and a lot of them are obese and sick and so I work on them and one of the best things that ever happened to me was being a guest on Forks Over Knives. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Yeah and I knew you were on there yeah. Yep and uh, that story I actually happened to be in Canada at the time they were doing the filming which they said is great because we don't have to fly to Hawaii to do the filming. We'll do that right there in, in Vancouver. And so that's that's where it was filmed. You know, when they, they start out, they have the byline Vancouver. And uh, a lot of people were thinking, oh, you know, Canadians. And so, and it was not long before people started recognizing me on the street. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I, had a, I was there visiting, giving a talk, because that's one of the things that happened. And in fact, well, do you know who Neil Barnard is? Yeah, he was on the channel recently. He's amazing. Yes, he is. He and I were, and Michael Clapper, mm -hmm. with Veg Fest a conference in 1980 or 1990, year, years ago. ago. And I was giving one of my very first talks. And so I was standing in the wings, listening to Dr. Neil Barnard. Mm -hmm. And at that point he said, and I was lecturing to medical students and they were scribbling, not paying attention, whispering and mm -hmm. this. And then he threw out this statistic by the age of 40, 40 men have erectile dysfunction. He said in unison, every head went up and he knew he had that, their attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was back, you know, years and years ago. Well, when I got my website going and uh, got some 
videos on YouTube, et cetera. I was getting emails in my website, ruthhydro.com, and I get emails from men who said, Dr. Ruth, I can't get it up. And I said, oh my gosh, they're confusing me with the other Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth <laughs> yeah. Westheimer. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, oh, wait a minute. But you're like, I, I can help you though. <laughs> Dr. Neil Barnard. And yeah. I thought, and so I would respond. I say, I you've got me confused with Dr. Ruth Westheimer, but I know the cause of most, by far, most mm -hmm. erectile dysfunction is your diet. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is what you've got to do. So that was a, a big change in people. And it still didn't get as much attention as the game changers. Yeah. You know? yeah. Have you seen that one? I've seen yeah. that too. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so that was... I think aimed more at getting men interested because you think protein and muscles and mm -hmm. protein and strength and protein and masculinity. And so you know that that's not true at all. That yeah. the most masculine men are vegan men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, it's been... Uh, quite a journey. I have enjoyed it. And uh, there was one mistake I made. If I had it to do over again, I would not do it. Because it was a modified radical mastectomy uh, back in 1983 is when they did that surgery. Well, 82 for the surgery. But after a year, they said, uh, Oh, let me back up a little bit more. Uh, they surgeons told me, you know, yeah. we ought to take the other breast while we're at it because uh, you're at such high risk for cancer in the other breast. So why don't we do a prophylactic mastectomy on the other breast? And then in a year, when you've got enough skin that's regrown again, if you can picture a breast that they have cut from the top of the top of the breast to the bottom of the breast, they cut the whole thing out and pull that skin together. And uh, there's no room for any kind of an implant. So you have to, back then, you had to wait a year. Mm -hmm. And so after I kept, I was running and in running singlets with this flat chest and so embarrassed. And I thought, oh my gosh, I hate, <laughs> and it is swimming. I was adding and uh, I thought, oh, I can hardly wait to get these implants. So a year later, I went back and the plastic surgeons, oh, I'd been stretching, pulling on the skin <laughs> twice mm -hmm. a day, trying to stretch it out. Mm -hmm. And the plastic surgeon said, oh, yeah, I think we can put kind of smallish implants in. I said, I was a B cup before, I, that's all I want is, is just to look normal. Again, they said, okay. So I had my first set of implants. And uh, in my first book, A Race for Life, uh, chapter 18 specifically was reconstructing a body and a life. So not only is diet going to keep you from re recurrence of the breast cancer, it, it can also help you uh, with looking normal again and feeling like you forgetting about the breast cancer history, you're normal again. Mm -hmm. Well, that was fine for several years. And as you may or may not know, they're supposed, they're not lifetime investments. You wait uh, eight or 10 years and you should have them replaced. And so I was merrily going along and through the nineties and the 2010 and, uh, happy with this and I wrote this up in, in A Race for Life. Well, in 2019, I happened to be back in Canada, in Vancouver, and picked up a local newspaper, picked it up. Oh, I, I could have had it to show you. <laughs> the Peace Arch News. You're on the East Coast, but the people on the West Coast would know Peace Arch News. Picked it up. 
And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And opened it up and I saw breast implant illness, a nightmare. I said, breast implants? Oh, that's silly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're absolutely safe. They, uh, surgeons wouldn't be putting them in you if they weren't safe. And I thought, well, I got to read what they have to say. So I read the column and the list of the symptoms. And I thought, oh, my God, that explains why my balance was getting bad. That explains why I was having joint pain. And I talked to Dr. McDougall. He said, no, you shouldn't be having any of these things. And I thought, yeah, oh, it could be causing it. Oh, and I'd go to doctors with these various symptoms and they say, it's your age. Because by this time, I was mm -hmm. getting up there in the 80s, well, through the 70s and 80s and having these symptoms. Well, in 2019, when I read that, I thought that explains all the problems because I knew it wasn't aging. Mm -hmm. And so I called the reporter and uh, she wrote the story because this had happened to her. And she told me how what they had done to her. But in Canada, they, she couldn't find a doctor to who knew anything about it. So she flew to L.A. and had her implants removed. And But this had been a couple of years earlier. So in talking to her, uh, she said, that there, there is a doctor here now who will do explants. Mm -hmm. And so I said, give me his phone number. I've got to talk to him. Mm -hmm. I realized I've got to get these things out right now. So again, yeah. I called the doctor and I end up talking to him. And he said, uh, yes, that's all I do is explanting uh, breast, silicone breast implants. And I said, please schedule me as soon as possible. And he said, give me your, I think it's the MSN, your, your number uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, your SI, uh, your SIN number or no. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's Canada, said, well, right? Yeah. I was in Canada. Yeah. I said, uh, Oh, I'm an American. So I, I don't have that. And he said, well, then I can't do the surgery. And I said, I'll pay what, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Green smoothie. Me too. Yeah. My me green too. juice. I made it before we got on and then I forgot to bring it out. I didn't want to stop. But since you <laughs> yeah. stopped, I was like, okay, I'm run. I've got my hibiscus tea. Nice. Amazing. Yeah, you know, the benefits of that. No, I don't, but I would love to hear. I don't actually. Are you familiar with Michael Greger's new mm -hmm. book, How Not mm -hmm. to Age? Yeah, I've seen it, but I haven't read it. Oh my oh. gosh, you've got to read it. Mm -hmm. it <laughs> have you got his book, How Not to Die? I do. I read that years ago. Okay. Okay. His newest one. It's 10, How 30. Not to Die. And so uh, reading How Not to Age. And I thought, well, you know, and everything I had, doctors said it's your age, <clears throat> and they, and they excuse, excuse me, they still think it's my age. Of course, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and but there's no denying uh, with their, the factors that he talks about. There are eleven factors of aging that he goes into. Hmm. I have a whole new vocabulary: AMPK, sirtuin, spermidine, cellular senescence. I'm trying to memorize them all. Uh, epigenetics. He goes through these and everything that I've been doing or having symptoms of can be helped with this. You got to read it. It's a fantastic Okay, I'll book. get it. Yeah. And the hibiscus tea is something he drinks, but he does it with lemon verbena. And I think it's because hibiscus tea is acidic and this, and you either wash your mouth after drinking the hibiscus tea or mm -hmm. uh, have the lemon verbena tea with it. So that's what I've been doing. Hmm. So well, um, yeah, the breast implant illness, I've heard a lot about this. This is part of the thing that's held me back personally from getting implants. Like I have considered it after breastfeeding two daughters, but I've just heard too many of these stories and I just want to embrace my body like it is. So you experienced these symptoms and then you had them out and did you experience what a lot of people I see experience, like these symptoms went away immediately or within a certain period of time? Did they go away after removing them? Most of them diminished. They have not all gone away. 
uh, mm -hmm. part of the problem is I had them in for so long. The ones I last had in 2014 were uh, the gel textured implants, which I was assured were safer and better. And what we didn't know at the time were these micro gel leaks mm -hmm. of both silicone and the heavy metals. Mm -hmm. So for years, I had these leaking silicone heavy metals into my bloodstream, which go <clears throat> obviously head to toe, brain to mitochondria. So I still have the chronic fatigue. I try to do running and uh, I can't hop. You have to get airborne to run. And I keep thinking, why can't I run? And I, and I do water running and think, well, I can do that. So why can't I run? And so I'm still struggling trying to get mm -hmm. back to running because I keep thinking, you know, if I turn 90 and enter a race, I'm going <laughs> to. And here's a chance to show people it's the diet. Just don't get the implants if you have a cancer surgery of any kind. Yeah. Because or even if you don't, even if you were somebody like me or somebody who's just considering getting them for aesthetic reasons, right? Like, what would you say sure. to somebody like that even? Yeah. Don't do it. In mm -hmm. fact, in my, I wrote a book. Well, I wrote the erectile dysfunction book from Neil Barnard. I wrote the breast implant illness book <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, from my own experience. Uh, but in researching it, I found that that plastic surgeons tell me that that's a 16 year old's favorite birthday gift. Daddy, can I have implants? I'm so small, I'm embarrassed. And daddy says, sure. And so uh, we've got to get the word out. Uh, that, oh, when my doctor, when I got back to Hawaii and had mm -hmm. my breast implants out, he said, uh, I've left enough room and skin for a replacement. I said, replacement? I don't, he said, I think you'll change your mind. <laughs> You're not going to want to stay flat. And so I said, oh, yes, I am. So I, there's a Facebook group, Fierce Flat Forward. And these are women who have elected to stay flat. So mm -hmm. I am one of those. So that's... Um, and that's amazing. And you're an, you're an inspiration. That's amazing. That's admirable, you know? Well, it's part of uh, what I, I said, the, the people you meet, the books you read uh, can have a major change in your life. And I don't know what else can do it. You know, you've got to yeah. educate yourself. You've got to, if, if you're lucky, uh, <clears throat> in terms of T. Colin Campbell, Chronic cough. I have not gotten rid of the chronic cough and the, the COPD. You know, I'm normal in for my age, but normal for my age is not good. You know, it's like, like your cholesterol is normal, but normal in Western societies mm -hmm. means that's true. What most people are true. So, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to be normal for no, all you your don't. blood work, for your blood pressure. I remember back when blood pressure was supposed to be 100 plus your age, that everybody's blood pressure rises. Your cholesterol normally goes up. But you look in the provinces of China, and this is where T. Colin Campbell made his great contribution, showing that no blood pressure does not go up. Hibiscus tea will help keep it down, which is why I, you know, to back up a little bit, I got hacked. I ended up giving co complete control to a hacker. Oh, <gasps> what? You know, no way. Oh, no, Ruth. I'm so sorry. Yeah. When did this happen? A year ago, last December. Oh. And I was so stressed, so upset that mm -hmm. I clicked on this app that I thought, was legitimate because it was the only one. Well, I should have been suspicious. How come it's the only one? But if it's the only one, then it's the one I want. So I downloaded it and he said, okay, here, do this, do that. And then I realized, oh my God, he's got access to all my banking information. Oh my, a, a driver's license information is on there. Everything. 
my credit cards, my banking. And when I realized that, it, my blood pressure. Well, <laughs> yeah, did. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. They're just ruthless these days. No pun intended, but they are ruthless. Yeah. These people, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So I had to immediately change everything and my blood pressure. Um, I had two doctor visits and uh, they said, you're in stroke territory at uh -huh. 180 over 120. You have got to go, go on these meds to lower your blood pressure. I said, well, I know it's not because mm. of clogged arteries and they said it doesn't matter <laughs> you know you can still have a, the stress from the stroke. stress right the stress yeah, yeah. so th they did scare me enough so i went on the drug amlodipine for about two weeks and i started meditation i started mindfulness and i started breathing and so those practices exist until today. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I do my first meditation uh, first thing in the morning. And uh, I also do aerobic, anaerobic, sorry, anaerobic exercises like flexing the quads and the glutes and, and uh, pectoralis and oh, hands, keeping grip strength strong as you age because, yeah, I don't want to ever have to ask for help in opening a jar. No, know? I got to start doing all this. You're doing more than me and I'm 41. This is inspiring. <laughs> and see, maybe the meditating and all that came out of that bad experience. It so did. yeah, it's terrible that happened, but there's always like something good that comes from it, right? Exactly. And this, uh, the breast implant illness, you know, while I'm sorry I did it, but that's part of my new mission, not only to get people to change their diet, but also be aware because it is not just the silicone that that surgeons use. They use silicone mesh to repair inguinal hernias. Mm -hmm. You know what an inguinal hernia yeah, is? Yeah, I do. A lot of people do. And doctors frequently will do an ex general exam and say, oh, you've got a little weakness in your hernia there. And most men do because that's where the sperm duct goes through. So there is that weakness there. And uh, they convince uh, patients that they, they need the hernia repair. Well, that because it's membrane, you can't stitch, you can't suture it together. Mm -hmm. They use the mesh and they put that in place. Well, guess what happens to the mesh? Same thing, micro gel leaks. In fact, it's even worse than the implants because wow. I talked to w one doctor who when I was telling him all this, his jaw dropped, his eyes wide. He said, you know, when I was in med school, my cadaver had, when I opened his abdomen out, he, there was a, a whole area this big of macerated tissue with the remains of the mesh implant. He said, that's what caused that. I, I'm so glad to hear you say that because that explains it all. And we need to tell people no silicone in. You. And another thing is your immune system recognizes a foreign body. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. They start attacking it and thinking it. Or they don't think <laughs> they expect that uh, the bacteria, viruses, fungi will die and that'll take care of the enemy. That's not so with the mm -hmm. silicone. And in fact, uh, people say, well, why can't they get, you can get the heavy metals out of your body. Why can't you get the silicone out? Because it penetrates into the organs. It goes through the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. into the brain. The only way you're going to remove that silicone is to cut out part of the brain. Obviously, you're not going to do that. Wow. And so that's why I have one of the symptoms still that I think I have to try to compensate for with uh, intention, focus, uh, practice, and with epigenetics and hyper, uh, 
let's see, I'm trying to think of the word, the brain taking over different functions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. neuroplasticity. I'm assured that brain functions, well, the balance is still bad. And I keep thinking, well, if I keep doing these exercises, it's going to get better. And then I'll have two or three days off, finally, uh, improvement. And then the next day, back down again. And it's, I have to keep going. There is yeah. no choice. That... Well, you're definitely doing the best you can. And I want to rewind for one second. I'm just really curious because I know you said at the time, your husband wasn't supportive with the diet when you decided to, you know, you're not going to get chemo, you're not going to get radiation, you're going to get the surgery and then just do a big diet, diet shift and go plant based. Yeah. Yeah. So that did reverse your problems doing that, just getting the surgery and going plant based. So what was his reaction to that when you're like, everything's fixed at a certain point, you know? Well, his reaction was, well, it helps for breast cancer, but uh, it it doesn't, it's a special diet just for breast cancer. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. 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 Oh, no, it's good for everything. Oh, it's not. There's no way. One oh, geez, the world good. we live in, I just wonder sometimes. And yeah. I'm wondering what exactly were you eating? Like what exactly exactly was your diet? Like what did your daily diet look like when you were healing that healed you? What diet was it? Like what foods were you eating in a day? It was strictly the McDougal plan, all these different, all the different recipes in here. In fact, there, there wasn't, weren't even, uh, you see the old paper clip here <laughs> and you see that. Yeah. All the recipes that Mary had provided in here, it was the starch solution. Mm -hmm. In fact, McDougal's book, the starch solution has my story in there. And, uh, and it, the cheese trap, for example, uh, uh, Neil Barnard has my story in there. So, you know, I've been helped getting the, the message out by a real example. It's not just theory. Mm -hmm. It's something that, that works. So it was a lot of starches. I love sweet potatoes, purple sweet potatoes. And then when I found out about the Blue Zones, remember when they came mm -hmm. out and Dan Buettner, all this publicity about the Blue Zones. And uh, I had been, courtesy of the Air Force, uh, a TDY, temporary duty, to Okinawa, the base there. And that's when I saw the Okinawan people and uh, their diet. 1045. <laughs> 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 yeah. 80 to 90 percent of their diet were purple sweet potatoes in them and they had the most centenarians well my goal was to be one of those so i'm not afraid of starches and potato they do not make you fat no <laughs> in fact uh, uh one of the things that happened was unintended weight loss i have lost 30 to 35 pounds and I didn't know what was happening, how, what. At first, it was, oh, you know, because of struggling to keep my weight down before mm -hmm. going vegan. I thought, oh, you know, this is great. You know, losing weight went down from 135 to 130. And when I hit 120, I thought, oh, perfect weight. That's what I was in high school. I'm going to keep that. Then I got down to 115 and then 110 got down to 95. Whoa. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. Well, sarcopenia was setting in about this, uh, the frailty that comes with aging because I wasn't doing enough resistance training, lifting weights. I wasn't mm -hmm. doing enough of uh, just regular exercise to keep the bones and muscles strong. So when I realized that it, at that weight, I have got to do something to keep my body going. And so I've regained, I'm up to 102 now. And uh, courtesy Doug Graham in particular mm -hmm. about the exercise. And he's helped me with uh, doing deadlift. You know, that's my new vocabulary, a deadlift. He says, <laughs> I love hey, it. How many pounds deadlift can you do? I said, Doug, I can't do any. 
He said, <laughs> well, that's where we start. And so uh, I'm up to 15 pounds. And look at you at 89. What a freaking yeah. inspiration. Like this yeah. is huge, yeah. right? See my muscle. <laughs> I love it. And have you eaten meat at all? Do you ever dabble in meat and dairy? Have you had it at all, all these years? It, it repulses me. Me it too. Amazing. Oh my gosh. It, it, yeah. And anything oil, I don't go out to restaurants. There's no way that you can avoid oil in restaurants because that's the result. That's what they, they do to make foods flavorable yeah. and make you want to come back. It's True. a day. And so it, it demands a real change in lifestyle. No mm -hmm. restaurants, no, uh, I guess their way in my ebook chef, cheap, healthy, easy, and fast. My cook recipe book. You can go to restaurants and you call ahead of time and say you want vegan, no oil. And with luck, uh, they'll listen to you. But uh, mm -hmm. it can be done. It affects your sociability. Uh, yeah. I have trouble not, I, I started to say preaching. Yeah, I guess it is preaching in a way. I, I tell people, you know how dangerous that visceral fat is? I have done that in the elevator. <laughs> you know, that's how bad. <laughs> I, you know, a, a, one of the other people who lives here is youngish. He's in his 30s and he's got this visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know him well enough to say, uh, I won't use his real name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you see that visceral fat there? That is deadly. You've mm -hmm. got to get rid of that. It crowds your organs and it inhibits your breathing, your heart, your intestines. You've got to get rid of that. And uh, he said, yeah, I know. My doctor said I'm pre-diabetic. I said, Joe, you know, <laughs> you got to listen. Watch Forks Over Knives. Yeah. And he said, What's that? <laughs> He's one of the people who... <laughs> Didn't recognize me from that. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm working on him. He yeah. says, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, I got to do it. So, yeah. And I feel like it's almost like with your journey, it's been like some destiny and just some synchronicities, you know, coming across John McDougall, coming across that oh. written thing about the breast implant illness, all of this. Do you believe in God? Do you feel like all of this has sort of been like synchronicity and destiny? And I know for me going like whole foods, plant-based, I'm raw vegan. I do feel closer to God and spirituality and the universe. And has that been the case for you with like the diet shift and the diet changes as well? Not the, not the religious. No, mm -hmm. no. Yeah. No, I yeah. wouldn't say I'm religious at all. I'm not religious, but I feel more spiritual and more spiritually connected with the foods, but that hasn't been an aspect for you. Um, I guess it's a matter of definition. Mm -hmm. There's no question that what I'm doing is the right thing that yeah. I do love leafy greens. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, did you know that if somebody tells you, Oh, I he, hate kale. In fact, I've had relatives. I, I could never eat a kale piece of kale. Mm -hmm. I told them you take a piece of kale in your mouth, you chew it up and let it sit there for three or four minutes and it will start tasting sweet. Because amylase, your salivary enzyme, starts working on that mm -hmm. carbohydrate and it tastes sweet. And that's true of any collards. The same thing happens. And so Caldwell Esselstyn, you know, uh, famous for reversing heart disease. Yeah. It says, he tells his heart patients, the ones that were so bad off, uh, the Cleveland Clinic said, go home. We've done everything possible. Stents, surgery, drugs. Uh, there's nothing more we can do. Just get your affairs in order. And Caldwell Esselstyn and his wife did take them under their wing and show them how. And what he says is six times a day, get some leafy greens and chew some. And that opens up your arteries, which heart patients, of course, need. Well, I'm doing it. Not six times a day, but uh, three times a day, leafy greens. So mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite foods. So yeah, in a case, there's a spirituality there. I'm doing this. You're going to help me mm -hmm. and I'm help you by spreading the word. So yeah.
yeah. you're 89. Like you're so healthy. You're deadlifting. Like to me, you're so healthy and you're just doing amazing. And you know, so much at this age, there's so much we can learn from you. Do you have some key foods that come to mind? I know you mentioned the sweet potatoes, but like any key foods for you that people could incorporate or that are staples for you, like maybe three to five foods or something for like health and energy and long longevity and living your best life into this age, like into your nineties. Fruits and vegetables, of course. And the fruits I love are combination of berries and citrus, like uh, oranges, lemons, kiwi. I love all the fruits. And the, the veggies, I love them too. Um, eggplant. Oh, what? I'm going to get delivered to tomorrow. Yeah, that was my call on the cilantro, mm -hmm. which... I love I, cilantro and parsley, yeah. like herbs like that do so much for us, right? Yeah. And that's in Michael Greger's book, How Not to Age, all these different foods. So, and what they do for you. So uh, blueberries, they have to mm -hmm. be here in Hawaii, frozen, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, every morning, not only blueberries, after reading this How Not to Age book, I had never heard of barberries. You heard of barberries? No, I haven't heard of barberries. Okay. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I'm going to have to check these out. I've never heard of them. So I ordered them and like my breakfast in the morning is uh, a cup of blueberries, a teaspoon of barberries. They're, they're tiny little mm. berries and uh, an orange uh, for the citrus. I uh, And I, I want to tell everybody always have vitamin C coursing through your veins three times a day, mm. good sources of vitamin C. And besides blueberries, barberries, strawberries have an effect on the body that lasts six hours. So you want strawberries twice a day. There is so much to learn about the details in the diet and how important these things are the hibiscus tea uh, for blood pressure. And the other thing I do, and I hope it's safe, on the tea bags, oh, green tea, I have mm -hmm. that too. I cut open, I don't put the bag in the water. I cut the bag and put the whole thing with the leafy, mm. with the green tea. I always get organic. And I thought, here's another source of leafy greens in the tea. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I have the solids and the same with the hibiscus. Anything with the colorful pigment is full of phytooxidants, phytonutrients. So in this mug, I have parts of hibiscus, the real red, and that's wow. what turned yeah. Yeah. And so. I think, I think you eat low fat vegan, right? You, do you think that's important eating low fat or do you think you'd still yes, be thriving no. if you were yeah. eating higher fat? No, uh, I do have, uh, not even a half an avocado. Uh, I do have some to get the, the good oils, the omega threes. So I have a little bit of avocado. A, a, I think an avocado lasts me about five days. So one that, avocado. One avocado. Wow. Yeah. So do you think anything can happen if we're too high fat? Yes. Yeah. It mm -hmm. clogs the arteries, it slows down, it sludges the blood. And you want your blood free flowing. And the rouleau effect is the high fat rouleau effect is your red blood cells start piling up like a, a stack of poker chips. And they have trouble getting through. That's from oils. So you you don't want oils. Uh, no more than an Even ounce. Even like of olive oil. oil or flax oil? No. Oh, yes. Any oil. Mm -hmm. Any oil. The fat that comes naturally in a food with fiber does not get selected out of the digestion, the whole thing. It's like the sugar in fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as it's it, the sugar's in the fruit. The fiber keeps it from getting digested and rising your blood, your glucose, blood sugar. Yeah. Okay. And what if somebody says, well, Ruth, look at you, like thriving pretty much doing so great at 89 vegan all of these years. 
But what, what if you're like, I'm scared to be vegan because what about the protein, the, the amino acids, the nutrients you could be deficient in? How would you say you've managed to not deteriorate and to live such health on a vegan diet? What do you think are the keys for you? That the amino acids are adequate in, in fact, there's a chart in my ebook. There are two, two different charts that show if you get enough calories from any one of the starches, you are getting the minimum daily requirement or more of each of the essential amino acids. Mm. You have to worry about getting too much protein, which mm. most Westerners do. And too much protein clogs the kidneys. There is an epidemic of kidney mm. disease and dialysis popping up all over. There are two new ones here, dialysis. And one of the problems that we have are people, that you, you know about the Lahaina fire that mm -hmm. we had. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, what hundreds of people that have lost their homes, lost everything. And the, a lot of them are, don't, can't see their doctors. They don't have medical records or whatever. And some of them need dialysis. And, you know, how do these poor people, what they don't know is that what they ate is what caused the kidney disease. There's just so much that, that go wrong when you're eating animal products and fat. It, even uh, flax seed is great, but not oil because yeah. it's okay. exposed to air, it turns rancid. So. And what would you say to somebody watching right now who wants to make a change? And they're like, Ruth, where should I start? I want to go plant-based. How should I get started? If you know the value, if you've got to be educated, mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't want to get educated, just do it. Uh, fruits and vegetables, your favorite fruits, your, say you don't care about eggplant or squash, put some balsamic vinegar on it <laughs> and Cook it that way. Balsamic vinegar does wonders for any of the veggies at Brussels sprouts. I have those every day. And and uh, you can ha have these raw or- It's cooked. 11 o'clock. Oh, oh, yeah, Don't worry, around. I won't take up much more of your time. <laughs> you can get moving <laughs> yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. You, you develop a taste for these and you start loving them. I love squash. Um, there were, what was that one food? Um, okra. Mm -hmm. Okra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When somebody showed that to me, I thought, oh, that's an interesting veggie. Can you eat it raw? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's amazing. You, you can't eat potatoes raw, but uh, that's, that's one of the starches. The McDougal program does say that people that we are starchivores. And so he promotes a, a starch based diet. So mm -hmm. I think both work raw. Yeah. Or yeah. Herbal. Have you ever done, have you ever tried raw or no? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have. Yeah. I was, yeah. yeah. I was raw for about 10 years. No it way. Was, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. And how did that go? Why did, how was that experience for you? It was good, but that's when I started losing weight. Wow. And oh I yeah. I attributed it to being raw. Mm -hmm. instead of the implants mm -hmm. so that was why and uh, not thinking I, I can't get enough calories but I don't want to make them fat calories mm -hmm. you know like eating more avocado and more nuts is mm -hmm. not the answer I still want to be 10 percent you know it's the 80 10 10 mm -hmm. whether it's raw or cooked 80 percent mm -hmm. carbohydrate 10 percent protein 10% fat. And that's, uh, you've got to juggle the fat because it's so easy to get too much. Yeah. Sometimes I get too much. And I'm wondering, where do you think you would be right now if you didn't take this plant-based journey? I wonder what would have happened if you, I feel like this was all obviously meant to be, but if you never came across the John McDougal well, stuff and never decided to go plant-based, who knows where you'd be right now at 89 instead, you know? Oh, at 47, the, the, the cancer would have just taken over, not mm -hmm. helped by the high cholesterol. It, it, it I wouldn't have made it past, uh, I think, a few years, even with chemotherapy and radiation, because as Dr. 
McDougall explained, chemo causes permanent damage to your immune system. That was another reason why I knew wasn't wasn't going to do it. And radiation damages your lungs and your heart. Another reason why I knew it wasn't going to do that. So, and looking yeah. back, are you still glad you did the double mastectomy yeah. surgery, or would you choose not to do that now and just change your diet, or do you think that removing it right away and doing the diet, what's the best method? For you, Dr. McDougall said the surgery is good because you want to stop the host from spreading more and more cancer cells mm -hmm. and get that tumor out of your body, and your diet will take care of the remaining cancer cells, which obviously have spread. And there's actually, I think, very little evidence for stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, because you know about cancer cells. They start right one, one cancer cell starts right away, building its blood supply mm -hmm. to spread. And this is micro, micro, nano technology. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it takes uh, a few years before they're enough, but it keeps, it's exponential, the growth of cancer cells in your body without changing your diet. So. I think stage one, you know, it's just a lack of clinical evidence that you've got it. Those cancer cells are starting right away. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether it's breast cancer or uh, colon cancer or melanoma, all the cancers, they, that's, Scary. yeah. Wow. And it's funny because a lot of it is still the same now with a lot of people still not really connecting the diet. You know, it's yeah. crazy. You know, at least people are waking up a lot, but still, I'm glad you figured it out. And you figured out a lot. You're almost 90. I love talking to someone at your age because you've just learned so much in life. Is there anything that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Any life lessons or wisdom you have at this age or any major life regrets? Anything to inspire somebody that might be younger going through a hard time and just okay. sort of like struggling to get through that? Another book I would recommend is, oh, let me see. What is the uh, Atomic Habits. Okay. Atomic, yeah, James Clear, who... uh talks about how, how to change your behavior and make it stick. Mm -hmm. And that book has helped so much. He talks about habit stacking. And if you want to quit eating meat, you replace it with something else. And replacement and, and then set up an association so that, for example, after I brush my teeth, I do a nitric oxide workout. And that association is there. Uh, when I do balance, I think, okay, now I do squats and, and then I do planks. And so you can modify your behavior with the techniques that they have in atomic hat. It's not the mm -hmm. atomic bomb. It's <laughs> an atom, you know, starting at the beginning of the habit that you understand mm -hmm. what habits are and how to change them and how to make them stick. So that would be my education on nutrition, exercise, and uh, behavior. Wow. So, Amazing. Okay. I'm going to get that book. I'm going to download it or buy it. I've heard of that book. Yeah. It's a great yeah. book. Okay. And do you think there's anything about your journey we missed that you want to share with the audience or any common question you think that comes up at your talks, anything else before we end off that you feel like we should share? And also let everybody know where they can find you. And I'll link your eBooks if people want to buy your eBooks or contact you. I'll link everything down below as well. Yeah, um, I'm here to help. My website, ruthhydrick.com, I get emails every day from people. Mm -hmm. So there are always questions. There are always more that I can say <laughs> or that I think, oh, I should have said this or I could have said that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way I'm going to get it all in in an hour. <laughs> I know, and, I know. So, yeah, yeah. So I'm here and uh, happy to help people with my website and uh, interviews like yours. You, you're helping a lot of people too, which is wonderful. Great. Thanks. Yeah. And I love how your cognitive function, it's so on point. It's so amazing. You never said pardon or what, like you're just, everything is working great because we're not supposed to decline like that, right? With the Alzheimer's or with hearing problems or, you know, forgetting things. 
Yeah, yeah. Dementia, it, there are definitely lifestyle factors involved. And you got to exercise the brain as well as the muscles. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And you're, you're big into fitness. You're amazing. Okay. I'll link everything down below. Everybody go follow Ruth. And I'd love to have you back on when you're 90, when you're a hundred, we'll have to have you back on. Cause I really, we're going to definitely see you at a hundred. Great. I hope yeah. so. I'm working sure. on it. Yeah. Doing you're amazing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, have an amazing day in Hawaii, Ruth. To the viewers, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If it added some value, give it a thumbs up right now. Make sure to subscribe for more videos just like this one. And I will put two other amazing interviews that I love on the screen right now so you guys can carry on watching those. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys. Bye. Aloha, everybody. <laughs>